bless the name of Jesus. Why don't we stand to our feet and honor the one who has blessed us one more time. We've come to lift up the name Jesus, for he is worthy of all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. We've come to lift up his holy and righteous name. We've come to lift up his, his holy and righteous, and righteous name. If you would, turn with me to the book of Psalms, Psalm number 27. Psalm number 27. Psalm number 27. Psalm number 27 is where we will, we will look today. I'm reading from the New King James Version. The Word of God says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army shall encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, and this will I be confident. One thing I desire of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his provision. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high on a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Though I will offer sacrifices, therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. I read for you Psalm 27, verses 1 through 6. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Eternal God in heaven, in the precious anointed name of Jesus Christ, we come. Lord, we praise you, we honor you, we magnify you. God, we thank you for another privilege to come before you, Lord. But God, you are good. You are merciful. Your truth endures to all generations. God, we thank you for another privilege, Father God, to come to the house of worship, to hear your word, to listen to your praises, and to participate in your worship. God, we don't deserve to be here, but God, you blessed us one more time. You blessed us again, over and over again. And for that, Lord, we are thankful. Lord, we ask you to bless your service on today. That we will be able to hear your word. And old habits will be turned away. All burdens will be thrown away. Lord, that we will lift up our voices and sing unto you and bless your name. Yes, Lord. Now, Lord, we ask you to keep us today. Bless us to deny ourselves in honor you. And, Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Why don't we worship God together in song. Let's lift him.
pray as we come today to worship Jesus, the conquering King of Calvary. Let me call your attention to Romans chapter 15. The New Testament, the book is Romans. The chapter is 15. The verses are 5, 6, and 7. In the New Testament, the book is Romans. The chapter is 15. The verses are 5, 6, and 7. Romans chapter 15, verses 5, 6, and 7. We found that you just will discover these words. Now the God of patience and comfort grants you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God and Father our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. I want to talk about protect the unity. Protect the unity. This is one out of two on this subject matter, protect the unity. Our faith five, our faith five is the makeup of our core values here at the New Beginning Church. We have been out of church and out of touch with each other for a year or more. And for that reason, I want to remind us in this series, faith five core values. Our series will be Phase 5 Core Values, and today's first core value is Protect the Unity. This is part one of two. Protect the unity. Protect the unity. Protect the unity. Even in our houses, in our communities, we have to protect the unity in the direction of each other. Every social club, every, every sorority, every fraternity has a way of coming together in order to protect their unity. Little brother looks out for big brother. Little sister looks out for big sister. Big sister looks out for little brother. Uh, everybody, everywhere, has to protect the unity of whatever establishment you are part of. Such it is today, we must protect the unity of our church. Protect the unity of the universal church as well as protecting the unity of the New Beginning Church. Unity is that glue that, that, that results in us sticking together. Unity is that substance. It is the end result of the substance of us having the same things in common. Unity is, is when we walk in the same direction, we say the same thing, we act the same way. There are churches, there are denominations all over this world who are having the same Sunday school lesson because they're walking in unity. There are churches all over this world that has the same mindset because they are walking in unity. There are people all over the world who walk together, even gangsters. They have the same unity, they walk together as one, what would it be like if the church of Jesus Christ would not only walk in unity, but protect that unity? What would it be like if we all would say the same thing? We all would communicate the same message. We all would do the same thing. It would be an awesome church. 
It would be an awesome situation if we would, would just walk together in unity. In the text, in, in, in Romans chapter 15, the writer Paul, the apostle Paul, the, the Paul, the writer of a great percentage of the New Testament, he begins this particular pericope in this chapter by saying, we must look out for the weak. In verse number one, he declares to us today that we who are strong ought to bear with the weaknesses of the weak. We ought to bear with the scoopers. We ought to bear with other folk. We ought to put, now this word bear, this phrase, bear with the weaknesses, what it's saying is not only do we put up with them, but we bear them up. We support them. We look out for them. We, we participate with them in a way that God can bless them. Yes. Paul tells us this morning to, to not just look out for yourself. Yeah, yeah. He admonishes us to protect the unity by, number one, looking out for the weak. <laughs> I say to you today that we, we wear masks because we're looking out for the weak. I know you're strong. I know you have no issues. I know, I know you're good. I know your doctor has given you a good report. But you're wearing your mask to protect others. Yes. And then when someone stops me and asks me, why do you have on a mask? Rick Perry and, and the rest of them and, and Greg Alex don't, don't want you to have to wear a mask. I said, well, I got on mine because you got yours off. In other words, we have to protect the unity of everybody around us. And I know, I know they say six feet, now they, they reduce it to three feet, and now they say take it off, take it off. And I know that the president and the vice president has taken theirs off. But we have to protect the unity of each other. Let me tell you, we've come a long way. And regardless of how far we have come, it is a fact that 600 plus, 600,000 plus people have died because of foolishness and shenanigans. In our church, in our church, we want to protect the unity of each other. We, we want to look out for each other. We want to make sure that we cover each other. Paul says if somebody is weak in their mind, look out for them. They used to say back home that, that God takes care of fools. I'm saying to you today, if somebody's acting like a fool, don't you get involved with it. Just look out for them. Paul goes on to say, we must, we must make sure that we protect the unity of each other by bearing each other up and bearing with each other. As we bear with them, that means we go through the changes they go through. We don't push them aside. We don't kill them off. We, you see, there are some countries in the days of old, they would kill off those who were born weak because they want to be a strong country. They don't want to look out for anybody else. But we are different in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I want to think so. We are different in the New Beginning Church. I want to think so. Verse number two, Paul says, let each one of us please his neighbor for good, leading to edification. Yeah, yeah. So as he says to us, if we're going to really protect the unity of each other, the unity of whatever organization or organism that we're involved in, we got to look out for the good of our neighbor. Yeah, yeah. Look out for the good of other people. Look out for the good of those we may not even know. And we must lead them to edification. The word edification means to lift up. We must lead them to, to, to build them up. Yeah. The word apotome, uh, okidome, <laughs> the word apotome means to build up. We must learn to edify each other, build up the body of Christ, because guess what? The gangsters are building each other up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the sinners are building up each other. The winos are building up each other. 
We have to build up each other. We are the only military, we are the only group of people who hurt our own wounded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The church. We ought to build each other up. He says, build up to the point of edification. Verse 3, he says, for even Christ did not please himself. But as it was written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus talking to God and Jesus is saying to God, God, those who messed over you, those who have got crossways with you, those who were sinners against you, I didn't even look out for myself, God. Their reproaches, their sins were put upon me. In other words, Jesus is saying, and Paul is examining us this morning and saying to us, we ought to look out for those who are weak. We ought to comfort them. We ought to spend our time being around them. We ought to make sure we look out for those who are weak. First point says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of scripture may have hope, or might have hope. Let me tell you, scripture ought to give you hope. Regardless of what you're going through, it was written so it will give you hope. Regardless of what goes on around you, the word of God was written so you could have hope. I told you on last week, I said to you on last week, man can live without food for 40 days. Have you tried it yet? Man can live without water for 40 hours. Man can live without air for seven minutes. But man cannot live without hope for two seconds. By your very being here today, I understand that you have hope. By your very existence tells me that you have hope. It doesn't mean that you weren't depressed this morning or last night. But if you're still living, you have some hope. The tragedy of it is when people have gone through the hospital and they've gone through all that they go through, and I listen to people who are in a coma because of COVID-19 or some other injury, they were in a coma for six months. The only thing their family has to say is that they were such a fighter. I want to serve you notice this moment. You can fight all you want. Matter of fact, you can have hope all you want. If God says time out, it is time out, and your time is up. I, I have a problem with those even who serve in the church, even those who say they are Christians or Christians, they have the ability to speak up for God, and when the camera is on and the mic is in their face, they don't give God the glory for their loved one coming back. They say he was a fighter. If this little baby really fought. Let me tell you, your baby doesn't even know how to fight. It's God that keeps him. Yes, and you ought to be giving God the glory for what God has already done. Yes, I mean, report after report, news flash after news flash. They say, oh, he sure was fighting. Let me tell you, he wasn't even in consciousness to fight. He didn't know how to fight. She didn't know how to fight. But what I'm saying to you is, you ought to give God, glory to God that he's given you some hope. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. We run up on verse number five. Paul, Paul says, now the God of patience and the God of comfort grant you like-mindedness toward one another according to Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. I just want to let you know Patience is endurance. Patience is consistency and constancy. Patience is doing things with a deliberate purpose. When you have patience, you're doing things with a deliberate purpose, and it's a deliberate purpose so much so that it makes you steadfast. fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because patience, uh, we it, we survive through patience. We endure through patience. We are consistent through patience. It's only through God's patience that God has given us. It's only through God's comfort that God has given us. We can't even brag on our own patience. 
the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine says it like this: By grace are you saved, right. not of yourself. <laughs> it's God's grace through faith are you saved. It's by God's grace that you're born again. It's by God's grace that you've been delivered. It's by God's grace that you've been turned around. It's through God's grace that you are who you are. You don't have anything to brag about because it's only through God's grace. And we got men, women, boys and girls who get old enough to talk and talk about how big they are. The Bible, the Bible says he is the God of patience. He is the God of endurance. The God that we serve, he is the God of patience and he's the God of comfort. Yeah, yeah. President Obama and Miss Michelle Obama has been given the label of those who are chief and in comfort. What they're saying is they've never seen a president and a first lady in office or out of office who is able to speak to the ills of the people when things go wrong. All right. They were there for President Bush both times his parents died. It's because they have put something in them and God has placed something in them to be able to, to feel the ills and the pain of other people. Yeah, yeah. Now you, had, you had a president <laughs> that couldn't feel anything but dollar signs. You had a president that, that didn't mind George Floyd being killed. You had a president that, that didn't mind all of us being wiped out. But when you are a chief consoler, you have a problem when things are hurting other people. When you are a chief consoler, you have a problem when, when people are going through things. When they hurt, we hurt. When they fall, we fall. So we need to understand, regardless of how strong and in comfort the Obamas are, God is the one that allows us to comfort us. Yes. He is the God of patience. He's the God of comfort. This word comfort means encouragement. Yes. This word comfort means exhortation. He says, the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. Now we know he's the God of patience, he's the God of comfort, he's the one that walks with us and keeps us, he, he blesses us, and he is the same God that will grant us like minds. And he grants us like minds toward other people. He grants us like minds toward what we're doing. In other words, he's able to grant us like minds because he's God. Yeah, yeah. And let me tell you something. When the prime example is a married couple. Many times, one couple comes from one side of the world and come from a, a, the other comes from another side of the world. The bride comes from here, the groom comes from there, and many times they got different values. Yeah, yeah. Many times they may be of different races. But it's an amazing thing to me that the God of comfort, the God of patience, can bring two different races, two different values, two different upbringings together, and they can stay married for 60 years. Let me tell you, it takes God to do that. <laughs> Nobody can do that but a God, and he is the God of patience, and he's the God of comfort. He grants us like-mindedness. And, and in a marriage, you can see people begin to grow alike, begin to look alike, begin to think alike, begin to exercise their minds alike. This, this phrase, like-mindedness, is to exercise one's mind. Like-minded means that you have the same sentiments and you obey the same thing. What would it be like at the church? <laughs> if we all had the same sentiments, what would it be like at the church? And, and what would it be like on the airway where everybody's listening to the same message and get the same thing from it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everybody go away saying the same thing about the message because we got a like mind. Mm -hmm. 
Nobody would walk away saying that preacher picking on me because you ain't that important for the preacher to send a message all around you. You, you, you don't have it going on like that where a preacher would spend all week long some 25 to 40 hours and sometimes 50 hours preparing to talk at you. If you have a like mind, you go away and you're saying, I got this out the message today. And somebody said, ooh, the Lord show was moving because I got the same thing out the message today. But because of our background, because of our mindset, because we're not on one accord, and because we don't have the like-mindedness that God wants us to have, we walk away with scrimmages. Yeah, yeah. Scrimmages. Messed up minds. And then somebody just got joy out of listening to the word. So don't think yourself so important that a preacher's gonna spend all his time just to lay out a message for you. But when we have the same mind and we have like minds, we have a like mind toward other people, toward each other. We all want each other to prosper. We all want each other to live right. We all want each other to have a bank account. We all want each other to have their own place to live. The tragedy is, as long as I'm on the bus stop, you're my friend when you can pick me up and say, girl, jump in, dude, jump on in. But the moment I start driving what I want to drive, and you don't have to do anything else for me, then she thinks she's something got that new car. Her car is better than mine. Uh, say that. And don't mess around and pay it off. I know that's right. I heard church folks say, he paid that car off already? And my car ain't ever paid, even paid off yet. Well, if you had done what he and she had done, you would have gotten the same result that he and she got. Because when you have of the one mind of the like mindedness, you have a goal in mind, you set your target to do something, and God makes it happen if you don't mess it up. Right. You have to admit this morning that we have messed up things. When God made it out, God put it on a platter. God lays it out for us, and, and God makes things right for us, and we come to the conclusion that God doesn't like us. And nobody messed it up but us. All of us have 24 point something hours in a day. Why is it that some people get further along than others? Is it because of the color of your skin? I say no. Is it because of the neighborhood you grew up in? I say no. Is it because your parents are, are not having a dad in the house? Let me tell you, I say no. There is no excuse on planet Earth why we don't get ahead. That's all right. That's all right. It's a mind. It's a heart. And much of it, Paul says to us today, much of it is based on how we think about other people. How we exercise our mind toward other people. It is the sentiments we have toward other people. Paul says, whatever you do, make sure that you understand we need to be of like mind because God has granted us like minds. Yeah, yeah. So we ought to be on the same accord. And he says, according to Jesus Christ, according to Jesus Christ. Let me just share with you, Jesus has blessed us. God has blessed us through Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our example. Jesus came here and rode around, walked around, didn't have a BMW, didn't have a Lexus, and now folk talk crazy about Jesus. He rode a donkey one time. And they bow down and they worship him. One time that, that is outlined, he rode in on a coat. And some famous person decided that preachers don't have any business riding what they ride in because Jesus rode in on a coat. I just want to let you know the coat was the limousine of that day. The coat, the coat, the, the, the donkey, it was the limousine of that day. Don't get so twisted on, on what a man drives because LeBron James drives what he wants to drive. Because Arnold Schwarzenegger has about 17 hummers and no one says anything about it. 
Let me just share with you. Keep your mind focused on what you have to do and watch what God does in the process. You have to be of the right mind, the right mind. We have to be in the right mind and we have to be common in that mind. And we have to treat people, have to have that right mind toward other people. Your neighbors ought not be fighting with you. You ought to be able to put up with your neighbors even though sometimes you want to get off on them. Sometimes your neighbors can go off on crazy stuff. But we have to live peacefully with all men to the best of our ability. According to Jesus Christ. Verse number six says that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's that one mind that keeps showing up. It's important what you think. It's important how you feel. This phrase, one man, mind, means your thoughts ought to be one. This phrase, this phrase one mouth, it, it means that your conversation ought to be one. We have to protect the unity of our church. We have to make sure that if something goes wrong, we can sit down and talk it over, pray about it, and move on. When you talk about one mind and, and, and one mouth, it, there's no room for gossip. There's no, there's no room for carrying somebody else's business around. And when you have one mind and one mouth, your, what comes out your mouth ought to glorify God. Look at what it says in the text. Verse number six, Romans chapter 15, verse number six, glorify the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying is, whatever comes out your mouth, all will glorify God. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask people all the time, I, I just want to ask you, does what you just said glorify God? The way you just act, did it glorify God? And then people will, people will use words, and then they'll tell you, that's in the Bible, that ain't a cuss word. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that word's in the Bible. I can tell you to go to hell if I want to. That's in the Bible. Well, you got to be wise enough to watch your context and your content. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because your context and your content makes a difference. Yeah. I want to say to you today, you need to understand that God wants to be glorified through you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This word glorified means to be honored. Yeah. This word glorified means to magnify and to celebrate God. Yeah. God wants what you what comes out your mouth to glorify him, to honor him, to celebrate him, and to magnify him. Yeah, yeah. Whatever comes out your mouth, it ought to honor him, it ought to glorify him, it ought to magnify him. If you can't get your mind right and get your heart right, keep your mouth closed. If it doesn't glorify God and you're not in, in the like-mindedness of Christ, if you're not one in Christ in your mind, if your heart is just not set, it's better to say, mm, and leave it alone. Because if your mind is not right and your heart is not right, what's going to happen is you're going to get your mind and your heart twisted up and the wrong thing comes out your mouth. And once it's out there, folk may forgive you, but they'll never forget it. All right. Yeah, that's right. Watch your mouth. He says, watch. He says, whatever you do, Watch your mouth and always glorify God. Mm -hmm. And let me just stop here and let you know, sometimes you can decide, I ain't going to say nothing then. Yeah. That's rebellion too. Mm -hmm. I just won't say nothing to you anymore. Mm -hmm. Rebellion. The Bible says rebellion is as witchcraft. Mm -hmm. You ought to be able to control yourself. You ought, you ought to be godly enough. The church of Jesus Christ ought to be godly enough to control themselves. Brother Miles said it right in Sunday school. If the same thing you had a problem with last year, you got another the same problem this year, you got a problem. We ought to be able to grow in Christ and we ought to glorify God in everything we do. We ought to edify him in everything we do. Now what I'm saying to you is you ought to be able to play cards and dominoes without cussing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You ought to be able to lose without acting a fool. You ought to be able to lose without tearing up the place. You ought to be able to lose without coming and saying, I'm taking my ball and going home. 
It's amazing to me. We talk about young children talk like that. I've heard grown folk. Okay, I'm done, Pastor Dave. You, you made me mad now. No control, no evidence of glorifying God. No, And then when you get home, you don't even think about it. Let me tell you, if you wreck yourself and you don't even think about how you wreck yourself, you are headed the wrong way down a dead end street. If you can just say anything and you can pop off at the mouth, you can just act in a kind of way, and then you tell people, just deal with it. That's just who I am. It does not glorify God. This is our, our first core value, to protect the unity. And as we protect the unity, we do it according to Jesus Christ. We are one mind, and that mind is the mind of Christ. We are one mouth. That mouth is to glorify God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Finally, verse number seven. Therefore, receive one another. Therefore, receive one another. I'm going to tell you, we, we had the opportunity to go to some people's house. And you can tell when folk want you there. If they don't want you there, first of all, they don't invite you. And then when you get there, they can tell you how long you want them to stay. They want you to stay. Because the fact of the matter is, in this world, this day, even young children can tell you when it's time to go. But when you go visit somebody and they let you talk as long as you want to talk, eat as much as you want to eat, and then you finally have to come to the conclusion, hey, it's getting late, we got to go. <laughs> then they want you there. Then they welcome you there. Paul says, therefore, receive one another. If somebody walks in this church, we ought to receive them well. Yeah, yeah. That's why I call every visitor. I try to call every visitor to see, see how they, their mindset was developed during the worship service. See how they were treated with hospitality or not. This word receive means to lead with hospitality. This word receive means to lead by way of friendship. It is the same word we get the word kononia. The word kononia is to position yourself intertwinedly with each other. This word, this word receive means that you ought to welcome them to the point where when they leave here, they say, no greater love have I seen in all the churches than at the New Beginning Church. It says, receive one another well, just as Christ received us to the glory of God. You know Christ received us. He received us well, and he received us to the glory of God. And the point of the matter is, we didn't have it all together. So when we receive other people, if we're going to do it according to God, then we got to understand that other folk won't have it all together. And when other people don't have it all together, don't act like you always had it together. Because if you always had it together, then I wouldn't be preaching about protecting the unity because you would be unified. And as we protect the unity, we show people love. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 um, admonishes us to love one another with a pure heart fervently. Love one another with a pure heart. Don't fake it. Love folk. Go, I don't care how you get it. You ought to get it from the Lord. But if you got to go buy some, don't run people off. Receive them with love. And if people are going to run off, let me take the blame like I already do anyway. And it doesn't matter who leaves, it's always that old pastor. And I'm all right with that. I'm all right with that. So he says, protect the unity of the church. Protect the unity of each other. To show love toward each other. This is the first core value of our church. This is a part of our faith five. This is our first core value, to protect the unity, to act out in love. Show people love. Be loving toward them. I, I, I get such a joy when I go home in November 
And after the, the church from Mississippi has come to town, and we try to rotate between churches uh, when they come to town. And when that church in Mississippi, whatever church it is, when they leave on two, three buses and they go away, and they may come in July and August, and we're walking through the Walmart in Indianola, Mississippi, and they look at Sister David and say, ain't you the preacher's wife? And then they said, boy, y'all sure knew how to lay it out for us. We really enjoyed being there. Y'all took us to the Buffalo Soldiers Museum. Y'all took us out to eat. We just appreciate the hospitality. And see, the thing about it is, they know what hospitality looks like and how the hospitality feels like because it is the hospitality state. I get so joy, so much joy out of hearing them talk about how well we treated them. How much more does God want to bless us if we just treat folk right? How much more does God want to bless us in a way where we can protect the unity of our church? Protect the unity of the universal church? Where your co-workers, your friends, and your neighbors, as well as your associates, can come to your church or hear your church online and feel the love that flows from heart to heart. That's what Jesus did. He showed us love. When we walk back up in the previous verses, Jesus says the reproaches, in verse number three, the reproaches that men had against God and God had against men, God laid those reproaches upon Jesus Christ. God laid our sins on Jesus. Jesus, a man who did no wrong. Jesus, a man who, who walked these mundane shores and never sinned. God laid sin upon Jesus. He took our sins. He took your sins. He took my sins. Up a skull hill called Calvary. He died on Calvary that day. They laid him in a bar too. He was taking my sins and your sins. He took the songwriter said he took our sins far away. The good news today is it was a victorious Sunday. Mm -hmm. Jesus rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. Mm -hmm. And if we learn to love people the way Jesus loved people and the way Jesus has loved us when we were not innocent, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. then we can protect the unity yeah, yeah. of our church. Mm -hmm. Father God, we thank you now. God, we bless you for unity in the body. We praise you, Lord, for just keeping us and wrapping your arms around us. We thank you, Lord, for just being good to us. Now, Lord, we pray for unity in the body of Jesus Christ. We pray that you bless us to be unified here at the New Beginning Church. We pray that you bless us to be unified in the universal church that men, women, boys, and girls will see the example we have one to the other and that they, do, they will know that we are your disciples by your love. The love that you've given us, the love that resides in us. We thank you now. We bless you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. There may be someone listening, someone here who's never confessed Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This is your moment. Will you come to Jesus today believing that over 2,000 years ago Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. They laid him in a bar or two. But early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. You can be saved right here, right now, today. The door is open. Let him in today. Let him in today.
up to me and allow Jesus to come in. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could join us in prayer, trust in the story that Jesus died and rose again. We believe that you're going to heaven when you die. For other than us who, who fall short on a regular basis, I pray that God continue to bless us and convict us to turn our lives back to Him. In Jesus' name. If you're here and you don't have a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church, where Jesus is a center of attention and a main attraction. Inbox me and let me know you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church, and we'll be glad to welcome you uh, into our family of faith. Thank you so much for blessing us with your presence today. Let it be today. Be in future. Jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting that Jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting that Jesus at yahoo.com. May I decide to stand? If you would come and bring forth the Lord's tithes offering and sacrificial gifts.
77048-4251 Chilmar Road, Houston, Texas. 77048 USA. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, God bless you and God keep you. This is, this is our prayer. Okay.